Hey, right, I'm afraid I'm sort of out of action for the moment. I've knackered my shoulder at my right shoulder. I did it weight training my New Year's resolution, which is a bit of a blur to my ego because I've weight trained most of my life, or most of my adult life anyway, and I've had a rest for sort of two or three years, come back to it, and instantly caused myself a mischief. Now, the major issue is that I'm right-handed, and at the moment I can't even lift my camera up to my face without making the little girly scream. So you're going to have to bear with me until it sorts itself out. Now, this left me with a bit of a dilemma as to uh, what videos to make this week, because I'm literally stacked out with review items that I'm already way behind on. But these are strange times where motor travel is concerned. We're at sort of a crossroads, the way I see it. My various inboxes have never been so busy. I've never seen anything quite like it since I started on YouTube five years ago. And although I am acutely aware that I need to strike a balance with this channel in producing, shall we say, a variety of content rather than dwelling too much on one particular subject, it's very clear both from the emails and messages that I'm receiving and from the analytics to this channel that there is a huge appetite for information relating to the advent of electric vehicles and the demise of the internal combustion engine. I'd like to say a big thank you to those people who have offered support and, you know, expressed a wish for me to continue on this subject until it's exhausted. And also to those people who have supplied me with snippets of information that I wasn't aware of that is also very relevant. And today I'm going to cover one piece of information in particular that was supplied to me, I don't know whether it was Saturday or Sunday morning, which if I'd known last week I would have included in one of last week's videos. But, you know, this whole thing is a sort of a, a tangled web that does take some unpicking. Now, a year or so back, the government announced that it was going to put £1.2 billion, I think it was, into building electric vehicle charging infrastructure into the fabric of our society. You know, it was one of those carrots that they dangled to persuade everybody that changing over to EVs is a good idea and that they're not going to have any problems getting the vehicles charged up when they're out on the road. And then in November, they quietly suspended it. Then, on the 15th of December, legislation was put in place, basically saying that builders of new homes would have to incorporate vehicle chargers in the actual build of the houses themselves, and that businesses that provided car parking for their employees, as well as supermarkets, were in time going to have to provide public chargers for members of the public and for workers to charge the vehicles up, or to be paid for by these various businesses, who of course will have no choice but to pass the cost of these chargers on to the public, whether it be through the purchase of your house, or a rise in the price of the products or services that those businesses provide, thereby transferring that cost from the promised public coffers over to the individual concerned, me and you. Now, here in the UK, we're all aware, or we should all be aware, that there are huge stealth taxes placed on petrol and diesel sales. Yet, yeah, when you've paid for a tank of fuel and you look at the receipt, it only sort of shows the VAT content of your purchase. But there is fuel duty, which the oil company itself has to pay. And, of course, they have to add that onto the retail cost of every litre of diesel or petrol you buy. Currently, I think it stands at something like 60 to 70% of the price you pay for a litre of diesel or petrol is actually tax. So just to keep it simple, uh, a year or so ago when petrol and diesel was round about a pound a litre, only 40 pence or so of that pound was actually purchase of the fuel itself. The rest was all tax and the UK government derives 5% of its tax income from fuel tax. From us, the motorists. And over the last couple of months I've received literally hundreds of comments questioning, you know, when petrol and diesel is gone, 
where are they going to recoup this revenue from? Because they can't just do without it. It has to be replaced. How are they going to do that? Now, I haven't had that many comments on this subject, but I have had a few comments saying, oh, you know, it's great having an electric car. I can fully charge it up at home overnight, and for like £7 worth of electric, I can go... 130 miles 150 miles whatever i don't have to pay road tax because electric vehicles are exempt you're all mugs for wanting to hold on to your internal combustion engines now my usual response to these people is you better hope that we continue holding on to our internal combustion engines because when everybody switches to electric you're going to start having to pay the vehicle excise license again. Once again, this is just a carrot dangle to persuade people to change over. Once electric vehicles become mainstream, in fact, probably sometime before that, they are going to start taxing you for using that vehicle on the road. And you are just plain stupid if you thought that was going to continue indefinitely. In fact, there are already rumours that vehicle excise licences for electric vehicles are going to start to be charged within the next couple of years, albeit initially at a reduced rate. And like it or not, you're already paying stealth tax on the electric that you use to charge that car up by way of the green levies. Again, this is a stealth tax, very similar to the fuel tax, to the amount of 25.5% for electric use that your electricity provider has to pay to the government and then adds on to the price of your electricity and then puts the 5% VAT on top. So you're paying VAT on tax. And that equates to tens of billions of government revenue every year from the domestic electricity user that the domestic electricity user doesn't even know they're paying or most of them don't anyway and again this money just falls into a black hole it's used to pay for a lot of things that your average taxpayer would not approve of that's why you know it's a stealth tax it's used to pay what are known as restraint payments to wind farms have you ever wondered sometimes why, when it's windy, those wind turbines are not working? Well, the reason for that is that when it's very windy, these wind farms produce too much electricity, and the national grid can't cope with it. So the wind farms are instructed to lock them up so that they're not producing excess electricity. And of course, it's not fair that these wealthy businesses shouldn't be allowed to generate electricity and make money when the conditions are favourable. So me and you pay these green levies so that they can be paid compensation for not producing electricity. I kid you not, that actually happens. This green levy is also used to subsidise people that have heat pumps fitted. That £5,000 grant, yep, you've guessed it, me and you pay for that in this green levy that's attached to our electricity bill. Rewilding the landscape, we've heard Boris talk about this, and of course we all have these visions of vast areas of the countryside being returned back to its natural state. But what it actually means is that wealthy landowners are paid not to grow crops and instead just to allow pockets of their land to revert back to nature. Private nature reserves that don't benefit me or you, but we pay for it. I'll leave a link in the video description that'll tell you all about this green levy. But now, let's get on to the main point of this video. Now, you may have heard that in the near future, a new generation of smart meters are going to be rolled out across the country to all domestic supplies, which again is going to be paid for by this green levy. But these new smart meters are not for our benefit. They're for the benefit of the government and the design to work in conjunction with domestic electric vehicle chargers. You see, back in the 15th of December, when this new legislation was brought into force about domestic chargers being installed in new build houses, the stipulation is that these smart chargers for charging your vehicle at home 
will be separately metered. And this is so that the government can differentiate between what is domestic electric use and what is electricity used for charging up motor vehicles. And these smart chargers will be programmed only to charge vehicles during off-peak times, that is between 10pm and 7am. And they will have to have a degree of connectivity built into them that will allow the government to monitor the level of utilisation of that vehicle. So basically, it's going to report to the government where you've been, how many miles you've travelled. It doesn't take a genius to work out that this is going to be used as a method of taxing the use of that vehicle. Now, I'll leave a link to an article that goes through this in the video description down below, but I'll tell you what my main takeaways are from this article. Now, first of all, it's quite clear that the government wants to standardise the method and facility for charging vehicles between vehicle manufacturers and manufacturers of smart chargers. They're going to standardise it and phase out the ability to just use a standard three-pin plug to charge a vehicle up overnight. So not too far down the line, you'll find when you buy an electric vehicle, it'll no longer have the facility to do that. You will only be able to charge it through the government-mandated charger configuration. Now, this legislation does allow you to override the charging times, i.e., you know, as it stands at the moment, if you need to charge it up in the afternoon because it's run out of charge and you need to be somewhere, you can override the, if you like, onboard programming that only allows charging during off-peak periods. But the government does make it quite clear that as far as these smart chargers are concerned, they will constantly review and change the specifications, presumably by means of software, as situations dictate. So I wouldn't count on that facility being there forever. In fact, personally, I wouldn't count on that facility being there for very long at all. This will basically allow the government to dictate when you charge your vehicle or even whether you're eligible for it to be charged at all. And that ties in quite neatly with the telemetry boxes, onboard diagnostics and anti-tamper legislation that we're looking at being introduced very shortly. They have already put every mechanism in place that they could possibly need to charge you two domestic tariffs, one for domestic use of electricity and one for vehicular use, along with the ability, should they wish to do so, to ground your vehicle by not allowing it to be charged, either because you have outstanding fans to pay for road traffic infractions, or your vehicle's onboard diagnostics have decided that your vehicle is not fit for the road because you have an underinflated tyre, or a bulb out, or you're overdue for your service, your ability to travel will potentially be at their discretion. And I don't know about you, but personally, I don't feel comfortable with that, especially after what we've witnessed in this country over the last two years. Another thing that does worry me a little bit for those who want to travel abroad is whether these charging configurations will be compatible with the continent. So even if the EU does get up to speed with their public charger infrastructure, are our cars going to be compatible for travelling abroad? Please, rather than just taking my word for what I've said in this video, utilise those links and have a look at the reports that have been published. And feel free to let me know your thoughts on the subject. Once again, thanks so much for watching this and my other videos, and in doing so, helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I will, of course, be back on Friday, so until then, if you're riding, ride safely, and I'll see you soon.